All right, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, Global Network Connect webinar on what is next in the fight against uh, COVID-19. My name is David Bach. I'm Deputy Dean <clears throat> of the Yale School of Management uh, here in New Haven, Connecticut, where it's nine o'clock in the morning, but I know people are joining us from all around the world. So good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, good night, uh, wherever you might be. Um, we had a first Global Network Connect webinar on the economic impact of COVID-19 on March 24th, about three weeks ago. And those feel like very, very long three weeks. A lot has changed uh, in less than a month. Uh, we're now at a situation where well over half the world's population is on lockdown. Economic activity across much of the world has come to a halt. Some experts predict that here in the United States, GDP in the second quarter will be 40% below last year's figure. Uh, and the number of confirmed uh, cases um, of uh, people with the coronavirus continues to grow. Um, confirmed cases probably topping 2 million today um, with uh, the number of dead uh, continuing to climb uh, as well. Today, we're going to focus on what's ahead as the world grapples with the pandemic. Um, what does the next phase look like? Uh, what are the implications uh, for different parts of the world? Um, what is the trade-off, if there is one indeed, between the social distancing measures that have been employed successfully to flatten the curve in many parts of the world uh, versus, on the other hand, the economic implications of essentially keeping um, workers, employees, customers at home. The Global Network is a great platform for exploring these questions. We're an alliance of 31 top business schools from all around the world, and it connects students, faculty, and staff to learn together to make sense of big global challenges. And if ever there was uh, a need and opportunity indeed to do this, it's of course uh, this current set of issues. We have a terrific panel. I'd like to introduce them briefly. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Professor Gail Allard, Professor of Economic Environment uh, at IE Business School in Madrid, Spain. Professor Arturo Brees, uh, he's a professor of finance uh, at IMD in Switzerland in Lausanne. Uh, professor uh, Yoshinori Fujikawa is a professor of marketing. Uh, he's at Hitotsubashi ICS uh, in Japan, connecting uh, from New Haven, where he's a visitor uh, this semester. Uh, we're delighted to have Professor Akiko Iwasaki. She's the Waldemar von Setwitz Professor of Immunology and Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology. Um, she is uh, a professor at Yale School of Medicine, is joining us from there. Uh, we have uh, Professor Ed Kaplan, uh, who is the William N. and Marie E. A. Beach Professor of Operations Research. He's also a professor of public health and a professor of engineering here at Yale. Uh, professor Surav Mukherjee, uh, who is Professor of Organizational Behavior uh, and Human Resources. He's joining us from the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore uh, in India. And last but not least, uh, Dean Alberto Trejos. Uh, he's the Dean of Incai Business School in Costa Rica, uh, and he's an economist. Uh, we will uh, try to run this session in a very interactive way, uh, short answers, and we look forward to involving all of you through a series of polls, uh, but also through questions. A number of you in advance have submitted questions that I will draw on, but I'd like to encourage you to submit questions as we go along. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom panel. You can use the chat to connect with other participants. More than a thousand people are connected from all over the world. So I'm sure the discussion in the chat will be quite exciting. If you'd like to surf as a question for us though, uh, please use the Q&A function. So I'd like to get started um, and ask um, Akiko um, about what we have learned perhaps just over the past month or so uh, about the virus itself. There continue to be a lot of unknowns, but we have learned things about how it's transmitted um, how we treat those who fall ill, um, what immunity looks like. At this point, what do we know? What do scientists know? And what do we still not know that will be important to figure out what's next? Uh, it's my delight to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'd like to start off with just the basics of this virus infection. Um, so coronaviruses have been around for many, many years. Um, uh, the other types of coronaviruses that we often encounter are the uh, common cold versions of the coronavirus. Um, and these things usually are circulating every year and uh, we just get a sniffles and headaches. Um, but unfortunately, there are other sort of zoonotic coronaviruses that have evolved recently. <clears throat> and these include the SARS coronavirus one, which is the closest related um, 
um, sort of cousin of this coronavirus that's going around right now. The COVID-19 causing coronaviruses is, uh, is the SARS coronavirus too. And it's also related to the MERS coronavirus. And um, so what we know about these viruses is that uh, they're very infectious. So once the uh, zoonotic transmission occurred from uh, likely from bat to a uh, intermediate animal, uh, likely pandolin, uh, to humans, uh, the virus adapted in order to transmit from human to human. And when that started happening, uh, this virus has the advantage of spreading across um, the population very rapidly because uh, humans don't have any pre-existing immune response to the virus. So this virus has the advantage of kind of spreading without any barrier. Um, the other thing that we learn about this virus is that it's not like the, the flu. Uh, even though in the beginning it was thought to be uh, just like a bad flu. It has a um, <clears throat> much higher basic reproductive number, which means it's more contagious than the, the seasonal flu that we encounter. Uh, it can infect, uh, one infected person can infect between two to three people. So that's why it spreads very rapidly. And the case fatality rate for this virus is also higher than the flu. Uh, so it's about uh, one to three percent um, of the the uh, case become um, uh, fatal, which is uh, depends on the age group uh, as well as the uh, comorbidities that a person might have. Uh, one more advantage that this virus has for spreading is the incubation period. So between four to fourteen days, this virus can exist in in a person with very little symptom, uh, if any. And um, this makes it very hard to control the virus uh, from spreading because a person might not know uh, that, that he or she is infected with the virus. Um, and, and therefore it's very difficult to detect the virus early uh, unless there are um, very um, sensitive tests that can be implemented to millions of people. Um, so what we know about this virus is that it also causes um, two types of um, kind of symptoms in people. and, and in uh, some people who are very healthy, um, this virus may be asymptomatic or cause mild, mild disease. Whereas in people who are older or who have um, pre-existing conditions uh, like heart disease or diabetes or obesity, this virus can become lethal. And uh, a lot of this lethality may be driven by the overactive immune response of the virus as opposed to the virus itself causing uh, the damage. So there's a lot to be learned about uh, immune response to the virus. Thank you for that. And maybe I can ask a, just a quick follow-up question. So much of the discussion, particularly around public health as it affects all of us, has been focused on these non-pharmaceutical uh, uh, um, measures, right? The, the social distancing, the staying at home. Um, but there is progress being made, I assume, on the uh, pharmaceutical side or the therapeutic side um, as well. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like, how the international collaboration among scientists unfolds there? We often hear, you know, vaccines are 12 to 18 months away, but progress is being made. Is that right? Yes, um, I think the science is happening at lightning speed uh, to try to um, tackle this virus infection in multiple ways. So uh, first type of um, intervention that we can imagine is antivirals. Um, so there are antivirals that have been used for other viruses that are now being uh, tried to combat this viral infection. So remdesivir is a, an example uh, of a viral antiviral compound that uh, are being currently tried. Um, there are other, other uh, ways to deal with this uh, disease. As I mentioned, uh, some of the severe diseases are driven by the immune response to the virus. So there is a lot of effort to block the immune response in severe cases in order to ameliorate the disease. So there are lots of biologics and drugs that are developed for um, auto-inflammatory conditions that are now being applied to, uh, to, to make this disease better uh, in severe cases of COVID-19. And then the, there are these vaccines that are ultimately going to be um, so important in, for us to come out of the social distancing measures. Uh, and, and that's been, I know that over 80 different types of vaccines are currently being investigated. Uh, some of them are already in clinical trials. Um, but the reason it takes about at least 12 to 18 months uh, is because um, the safety and efficacy of the vaccine has to be tested in human population. 
And this is not a trivial issue because um, other attempts uh, that have been made against the SARS coronavirus one, um, the vaccine approaches uh, sometimes led to a, a worse disease outcome. So it, every vaccine has to be uh, carefully investigated before it can be applied to millions of people. Thank you for that. And, and Ben, if you can hear me, if we can launch poll one, where we're trying to uh, get a sense of how worried people are uh, about their individual health at this point. Let's turn to um, the economic implications. We'll come back, uh, Akiko, to, to, to you uh, shortly as we think about what the next phase looks like. But I'm looking forward to getting a, a sense from our uh, audience, uh, whether their personal, uh, their concern about their personal health has, has increased or decreased over the past uh, three weeks. And while we wait for those results, uh, let's uh, perhaps move on to another very important area of anxieties, which of course is, is the economic fallout. And Arturo, you've been studying this carefully, you know, really from a global perspective. Um, we're seeing governments respond all around the world, uh, some similar measures, some different measures. Uh, broadly, what tools are governments deploying? You know, what is working? Do we have a sense already? Mm -hmm. let, me, let me say first, uh, hello to everybody and thank you for having me here. Um, also to, to Akiko's point earlier, I think that now the debate has become more economic than epidemiologic. And if I may, let me justify that. I think that from the epidemiologist's point of view, we had discussions this morning in the context of the Swiss Confederation new plan. I think the best option is to wait. Wait in the hope of a vaccine or wait uh, to learn more about the disease. But I think that now the reason why we are confronted with the, an economic challenge is that we need to go out and we need to deconfine people because otherwise our economies cannot afford to wait. Okay? Uh, some economies, for example, the Swiss economy, where I am now in Switzerland, we could wait because we're a rich country, we don't have debt, you know, we don't have public deficit. But you know, most economies cannot wait. And I think that's the first imperative. You know, we need to deconfine, we need to restart, and we need to relaunch our, our economies. Okay? So to answer your, your question, more, more specifically, obviously, this is a one-off event in our history where we need governments to intervene. I don't think this is a question about political affiliations. I think for a catastrophe like this one, we need governments to intervene. In the European context, for example, we have estimated that if governments do not do anything at all, it would cost our economies, assuming that the pandemic is over in three months, about 20 to 25% of our GDPs. And I'm talking about France, Germany, the UK, Spain, or Switzerland. So we need governments to intervene. And we need governments to intervene directly by sustaining people, by, I will not say subsidizing, but by promoting the real economy, which is something different from what happened in 2008. I think we need governments to use fiscal policy to reduce taxes, to promote consumption, to also impose or to favor uh, supply side policies. So our economy goes back to normal as fast as, as possible. And I think uh, this is the final point that I, want to, that I want to raise on that. There is a big dilemma is that we need to also realize that reopening our economies earlier rather than later is going to cost human lives. So the dilemma here is between the economic aspects of it and the human aspect of it which I think governments should be able to confront as well. That's not just for economists to say. My answer as an economist is, if we need to restart the economy, what do we do? But it's up to governments to decide when and how we do that. Thank you for that. And I know we have uh, uh, two other economists uh, on the panel. So I'd just love to see Alberto and, and, and Gail, if you agree that now is not a time for partisanship or, you know, abstract debates about the role of government in the economy. This is the, if there was ever a need for massive government intervention in the economy to stabilize, um, now is it. Alberto, where you sit in Costa Rica, is, is that how you think about it? And of course, with the benefit, not just of being an economist and a dean, but having served in, in the government of your country. So as you're looking at this, do you agree? Are governments doing what they have to do? Um, well, first of all, I, I think that going along with what Arturo was saying, this is not the right time to fall into ideological debates. Um, for all practical purposes, we're in a war economy right now and in war politics. 
uh, it's also a terrible time for people who used to be saying, let's do X six months ago and six years ago and six decades ago to now say, because of the pandemic, let's do X, right? If what you're proposing did not change with the pandemic, then, then it's not about the pandemic. Um, now, the, the, I think that governments have gotten very, very mixed results. Uh, simply on the, on the ep epidemic front, I mean, there, there's certainly enough countries that have had active cases falling now for, for weeks or months um, that have reached a plateau, uh, that have enjoyed lower mortality rates than other countries. And, and, uh, and the, same is not the, play, the same is not true everywhere else. So, so I think that some students get an A and some students, get, some students flunk the course. Um, you see, for instance, in places like South Korea or Germany or Iceland, uh, that enough testing has been done that business analytics can be thrown into the problem. So you can go straight into uh, de dealing with this with a, with a scalpel rather than a hammer. Um, you see countries uh, like Denmark or Sweden where sufficient agreement between business, labor and government has been reached to spread the cost in a, in a, in a fair way across sectors and therefore minimize the potential economic and social impact and, and to make sure that, that nobody falls within the cracks. Uh, some countries, are, including my own, enjoy the fact that for years they've had a, a comprehensive national healthcare system that provides universal care. And, uh, and some countries at least seem to have seen this coming early and, uh, and acted promptly and aggressively, in, including some poor countries that are getting very good numbers. And in the meantime, other students are flunking this course. <clears throat> in, in many countries, a reaction was too timid was to politicize. In some countries, this was trivialized and, and a populist message or a xenophobic message was, was thrown at the problem. Uh, enough action was not done. And, and I think that in, in most, uh, in, 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 in the biggest uh, Western countries, sadly, that's why we see such, a, such bad outcomes. Now, if we go outside of the epidemic part to the economic part, I think that on the one hand, most governments seem to have done certain things right. So we sort of got right. I mean, we also had 2008 as the dress rehearsal um, on the notion that, okay, some stimulus needs to be given. And on the notion that you cannot fire all your fiscal bullets on the, on the, first, on the first five minutes of the battle. Or on the notion that the proper functioning of the banking system and the proper liquidity of asset markets, especially government debt markets, needs to be kept. And I think in, the, in that sense, we, we, we seem to all be doing better than usual. On the other hand, I believe that uh, most countries, most governments have failed in providing to their population and to their business uh, sectors um, a clear narrative of where are we going? Of when we reach what in the health side, can we release, we release which controls? And can we reopen in which ways? And when health, case, health issues complicate again in a second or a third wave of contagion, what controls come back and how do we react? And in the absence of a proper narrative and of the proper measures of how do we act when we are open, uh, the, the economic cost is maximized. People overreact um, uh, and, and, and people make bad decisions. I also think that while we do not have uh, protocols of how do we operate uh, uh, safely, then the only safe thing to do is not to operate but that is not sustainable. So we actually need to shift the conversation into what is the safest way to operate some things at least. And, and that, again, that requires a clarity that most governments are not daring to provide because they don't want to throw out forecasts that they are gonna fail. So the safest way to operate is one that we'll come back to. And you know, Ed Kaplan who's joined us, you know, has done a lot of work on, on modeling and the role of testing. And Akiko will come back to you as well to understand um, what, what safest might mean. I want to stick to the uh, economic point and just uh, call out to people that anxiety about the virus continues to increase. Uh, you know, 41% are more concerned about their personal health today as a result of uh, what we see, not just in, in Northern Italy or in, or in Spain, but in New York City and, and so many other places around the world. If we could then please launch a second poll on economic anxiety and you know, Gail, there have been two different references, both from Arturo and Alberto to 2008. I think Alberto called the financial crisis a, a, a dress rehearsal. And of course, you've, you've studied uh, how Spain, how many other European countries uh, dealt with the financial crisis. Um, how similar or different is this as a, as a policy challenge? What have we learned about responding to the previous 
sort of major global financial crisis that might inform government policy making at this point? And, and do governments seem to have learned those lessons? Mm. Yeah, I think something that's very similar is that um, we have so little time to react. You know, in 2008, we're, we're watching a meltdown in the financial system and you're deciding overnight, who are you going to bail out? Who are you going to let go? What are you going to do? And I think, you know, that probably is the nature of crisis, that it hits you fast. But this one, since it's lives at stake and not um, just, a, you know, a banking system or a financial institution, uh, I say just, um, but, you know, compared to um, tens of thousands of lives, it does look small. And so, you know, the, the decisions that are made become more critical. We can't allow a lot of mistakes. And in this sense, I think, you know, Alberto was talking about good and bad policy. And I think this crisis is putting a lens over our institutions in many ways, because um, if you have Denmark, you know, lots of consensus, small country, uh, trust in government, you know, they move fast. Um, but other countries where you see maybe devolved powers to the regions and they don't agree with the national government, um, as in Spain or, or as in, in the United States, or you know, excessively partisan debate, um, you're seeing that, that they can't really talk about the issues. Um, if they can't focus on the issues and, and therefore come up with reasonable policy responses. Like for example, what do we do? Do we lock down and for how long? Or is there some lower cost measure um, that we can follow and organize? Um, that, that might have a similar result on you know, the, the spread of the epidemic. So, but when we think about Europe, um, what I, the lesson I do think was learned uh, after the last crisis and then the Eurozone crisis is that you can't play the austerity game when the stakes are so high. And I, you know, I'm really excited to see that in Europe because you do see, even though there's the usual debate between the North and the South, uh, there is an understanding that, yeah, this is, a, this is a, gonna be a deep economic crisis and a humanitarian crisis. And we need to forget about, you know, flogging people over their debt levels. We need to find some sort of um, joint instruments to, to address the problem. Um, and I think that's, even though it's being difficult for Europe, I think that's a really important step forward. You highlight such an important point, right? That it may not necessarily be uh, the, there we have the result, by the way, with 80% being more concerned about their personal economic situation now than three weeks ago, to Atuto's point that as much as our focus uh, has to be still about this as, as being a, a pandemic and a public health emergency, the economic realities really are, are taking center stage as people are making sense of this, right? And that, of course, has implications for how we uh, deal with a pandemic in the first place, because these things are related. But to your point, Gail, um, that perhaps it isn't going to be so much uh, variation in policy tools as it is variation in trust in government and the level of partisanship that determines how an economic course gets chartered here, right? Because the, the tools yeah. seem to be somewhat obvious. The question is, can you muster political support for them? Do you have enough trust in institutions? Can you bring people together and do this fast? Or does everything get looked at in, in a partisan or perhaps even populist um, way? In these different places. That's right. And, and you know, the perfect example was the battle over the stimulus bill in the United States. Everybody knew we had to do something big, fast, but then the battle over who gets supported, who gets taken care of. Um, in Spain, for example, we saw some learning, which was great. Um, the, um, Spain has copied the German system of uh, short-term working, where they go ahead and subsidize workers that are temporarily laid off. And, you know, those things, that, that's really positive, but, but we are seeing a lot of policy failures, as I've just said. And I think it is, like you said, an institutional question. And we're gonna launch the next poll and try to get a sense of how satisfied people around the world are with the way governments are actually responding. And so Rav, I'd like to turn to you because um, certainly here in the US, it seems the debate has been largely sort of the, the wealthier parts of Asia, Western Europe, the United States, but uh, you know, anybody, uh, listening to what Akiko said about how the virus spreads has to be incredibly concerned about very densely populated urban centers, particularly in uh, developing countries and emerging markets. You're connected from one of them in, in, in Bangalore. And of course, the Indian government instituted this unprecedented 21 day lockdown a, a couple of weeks ago. What's the situation in India right now? And what you've heard, um, how does it look differently, if at all, 
uh, in a place like India, the most populous democracy in, in, in the world, as policymakers and public health experts are organizing a response? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think uh, we our rates of infection and the death till now is, is quite on the lower side. If you look at our numbers, uh, we total active cases are about 10,000 dead about 396. So, and, and this is a consequence possibly of in the first place, we not being so much integrated with the world and especially China. And, and secondly, the bold decision by the government uh, to lock down the economy on 25th of March. Now, having said that, parallelly, there is a unfolding human tragedy that is, uh, that is happening here. See the very big difference between India and the rest of the world and especially the developed world is that not only we have a lot of poor people, but we have a large number of migrants who travel from villages to cities and go back in terms of you know, seeking livelihood. And, and these are the people who were all in these big cities uh, when, the, when the country was locked down. Now, yes, the government probably at that point of time did not have any option but to do the lockdown, but the suddenness of it meant that close to, and I repeat these numbers, close to a 130 million people were locked down away from their homes without any money. Now, when you and me get locked down, our assumption is that we have money, wealth, credit cards, income flowing in so that we can survive the lockdown period without largely stepping out of home. And the second very big assumption is that we are at home. Now, so, you know, the, the problem here now is that the, we somehow, to me, it seems that we have been very focused on ourselves, the privileged class, and, and we have to acknowledge that this is a, a, a disease which has been brought into the country by the privileged class, right? And, and then we are so focused on ourselves that we have completely forgotten, at least to, to me, it seems like that, about the plight of these people. And as you know, Alberto just pointed out that yes, when you have nothing to do, probably the, the first thing to do is to close down everything. But I don't think we can afford to copy that model for a very long time because lots and lots of people are saying that Indians are likely to die of hunger, of starvation in greater numbers than this disease is, is, is going to do it. Right? So I think we have a very strange situation from that perspective that how quickly can we go and you know, uh, stop this complete lockdown and make sure that people who are... I mean, this is just amazing, uh, David, that yesterday or day before yesterday, the, the prime minister declared that again, the lockdown will be extended till 3rd of May. And there were in the city of Mumbai, there were thousands of these migrants who went and protested in a station saying that, guys, we are stuck with no money away from home. Please allow us to go back home. And so, so that's where you know, I would position that, that we are in a very, very tricky situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that and, and bringing that into sharp relief. I think Arturo mentioned earlier and others have as well that um, the, the, the economic response or the lockdown to the pandemic can in itself has, have sort of public health implications and we have to strike a balance. But when you put it in the terms that you just put it where people could starve because they don't have access to, uh, you know, to their work, to income, um, then we're no longer talking about sort of either or responses. We're talking about somehow striking a balance, being resilient and responsive. And, and that's where I'd like to turn out by inviting our last two panelists. And um, Yoshi, um, you know, Japan um, was one of the first countries outside of China to be affected. Uh, I, I thought, you know, sort of received praise for uh, its initial response and now after an initial sort of let up, we're now seeing again um, in, in Hokkaido and elsewhere a state of emergencies being imposed. And so as, as one of the countries that is perhaps somewhat ahead of others, can you give us a sense uh, from people you speak with how people are adjusting to the possibility of second, third, fourth waves or, or local outbreaks and, and how people are settling into this? And perhaps relatedly, if I can add something else, how do you deal with this as a business? Everybody here is talking about when are we going to open up again? And nobody understands that opening up might mean being ready to close down again at any moment or doing a whole range of things in between. 
Yeah, David, uh, uh, thank you so much. So I'm sitting here in New Haven for the last couple of months, um, like, you know, joining here today with the spirit of uh, sharing should be the uh, best way of learning uh, with each other. And then we all here, uh, like in each different part of the world, are basically trying out our own version of, like, you know, the approach to this uh, challenge around the world. So we, in a sense, like as a global network, we're creating this live case that we can learn uh, from each other and then hoping that uh, what I'm sharing today uh, from my own experience with my own country back home uh, will uh, probably provide uh, you all with the, uh, yet another like an example uh, of the, uh, uh, any other country has not been experiencing. And, and as uh, David, as you have been just mentioned that we have been already through this uh, since almost like, you know, the, uh, 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 since the end of January actually when the cruise ship uh, like, you know, they are uh, stopping by in the port of Yokohama and then that they are uh, all of a sudden this, like, you know, the things that we need to uh, respond to it. And while that we also start have to having to uh, um, handle the situation uh, inside the country as well. So back to what Alberto was referring to uh, this, like, you know, the uh, Thomas uh, Pueyo's the Hammer. Uh, versus the dance that uh, we have been trying to do our own version of the dancing that uh, although it's not as beautiful as it is with our like in the neighbor countries like you know uh, Taiwan and South Korea and in Singapore uh, but uh, we are trying uh, you know our own version uh, of it and as of today that uh, we have never been uh, locked down in a sense that the uh, rest of the world is using that terminology uh, although government uh, at national level and, and then also local government, uh, David, you mentioned Hokkaido, uh, they did the uh, second time the state of emergency a couple of days ago and Tokyo, other major cities uh, declared the state of emergency like last week. And as of today, uh, like, you know, we are very similar situation to what the Solar was saying in, in India that in terms of uh, confirmed cases about a little over 8,000, and then the number of deaths is about 120 as of today. And so, uh, in a sense that we have been, like, you know, we are, it looks like we've been containing it, but at this fear of uh, when and then how and then if uh, that uh, the second wave uh, may be coming up, or maybe we have not yet experienced even with the first wave that is actually about to happen uh, in Tokyo. I mean, they're talking about the major city, and we are the city of close to 40 million people using public transportation every day, you know, in the morning and in the evening and all of these, you know, perfect, uh, like, you know, the situation where the uh, COVID-19 comes in and then making an impact uh, on that. And, um, you know, the other uh, neighboring countries like, you know, South Korea, uh, Singapore, and especially Taiwan, they actually uh, went through this start back in 2003 and they have, experienced all of these and they have been prepared for it. And then we were back then, luckily, and now unluckily, uh, we didn't get impacted by this SARS. And, and, and so that we are like, you know, the less prepared uh, for that. And so probably add later on that you're gonna be talking about like and how important that this testing uh, is when it comes to reopening or like, you know, keep the economy going. And we have not been doing that much great job on, in, in, you know, when it comes to uh, testing, but somehow that we are like, you know, they are managing, uh, muddling through, uh, in a sense. And then also, like, and as you know, the our, our country of Japan has been going through this the, our stagnation of the economy for the last couple of decades. And uh, talking about like, you know, the uh, how much of the uh, luxury that are you, we have in an economic situation, Arturo was talking about, and we're the number one gold medalist, I mean, talking about Olympics, when it comes to debt to GDP ratio that the 250% uh, of the uh, debt to GDP ratio, it's a world record, like a holder uh, of it. And so the government has been like, you know, trying to balance between, like, you know, back to David, it's not either or, right? They're how to balance between like, you know, life at the risk, uh, medical sense, as well as like an economic sense and how to go like, you know, denouncing uh, this state of emergency. And so they have been only uh, doing this request and then uh, we call the Japanese word jishuku, that self-restraint. So government can only ask the uh, national public to restrain yourself from engaging in like, you know, the economic activity as we used to be in terms of the extent. And on top of that, uh, constitution that we have as a country, 
doesn't allow the government to have any impose or constraint over private individual rights because of the, our, our learning from the uh, World War II, 1947, like, you know, this constitution basically, uh, like, you know, they are prohibit the government from putting any sort of like, you know, the uh, private individual, uh, like, you know, constraint on the activities. And there's allergic reactions uh, to that inside the country, as well as from our, like, you know, different countries. Uh, in the region. So how can we go about like, you know, managing this between control on one side and then like, you know, the uh, self-restraint uh, on the other side? And then we've been already explaining, experiencing uh, this pretty difficult to control because people cannot really, I mean, we've been through already two plus more months by now, and then they can just, just, just stay at home and then the storage is still operating and all of these. And so life looks like as it is uh, used to be, uh, you know, except for the last this past week, that the uh, more uh, like you know they are um, stronger uh, sense of uh, like you know the people t try harder uh, to like you know to stay home. But the last week, just the last piece of information is last week, two weeks ago, when the government uh, like you know set the uh, close down of the uh, school, and after two three weeks, and then it seems to be like and everything is being controlled. And then so the government decided to uh, declare that, that we do no longer need to keep this like, you know, the school uh, closed. And the people took it as very positive, like, you know, the uh, message that we can no longer, we don't need to no longer stand at home. And then that just coincided, unluckily, with the you know, perfect timing when it comes to cherry blossom blooming. And that's actually one of the most important, like, you know, time of the uh, year for our country. And then people start going out, like, and enjoying these flowers and all of that. And now, now we see like, you know, we, are, um, we start paying the cost of it uh, two weeks later. And so that's where uh, we are. So back to like, you know, how do we open uh, or how to go back to, uh, or whether we are actually going back to, uh, like, you know, where it used to be, uh, that's the our balancing uh, act that we really need to uh, keep in mind doing it. <clears throat> and, and hopefully that kind of balancing is informed by good models and, and solid data. And Ed, I know you've been modeling this pandemic uh, from the beginning and, and other public health emergency in, in the past. You know, I know one of the things that you've long been concerned about is if people are complacent and ignore a possible second wave and other waves. You know, how do you size this up in terms of the inside you glean from models and what are the implications for how governments and others ought to respond and, and, and manage this sort of balance between loosening up with preparation and, and, and measures in place to, uh, to take countervailing measures if, if the data is supported or, or, or demanded. Uh, thank you, David. Um, first of all, my, my focus has been intensely local, as in Connecticut uh, and in the eastern seaboard of the United States. So what I'm about to say uh, will not really apply to the situation that Sourav so movingly uh, de uh, described uh, a few short moments ago. Uh, different approaches are going to obviously be needed in different parts of the globe. But let me try to summarize the situation as I see it unfolding in most Western countries where I think we're in trouble and, and uh, what needs to be done. So the most common response to this has been since we lack the usual public health tools for dealing with an infectious disease, which namely are a vaccine on the one hand or appropriate uh, therapeutic treatment on the other, we really uh, have to go back to public health basics. The movement to put in lockdown-like restrictions, and I'm saying lockdown-like because there is a huge difference in how these things have been implemented in different countries around the world. If you look at what happened in Wuhan, people literally could not leave their apartments. People staying inside was enforced by drones with cameras. All transportation in and out of the city was cut off. It was a complete isolation of a city, a metropolitan area of 10 or more million people. When people think that what we're going through on the East Coast in the United States is a lockdown, it's actually a bit of a joke to even use that term. You can take a train to New York today if you like, and you can come back from New York. Airplanes are still flying, people are still moving. 
So while indeed there has been a move to uh, urge people to stay at home, the compliance has not been anywhere complete. Nonetheless, let's ask ourselves what lockdown like measures are supposed to do for you. And the first thing is that they are not in any way a way to end an outbreak because what you have here is essentially a delaying tactic. What you can do is greatly diminish transmission for a short period of time corresponding to however long these lockdowns are in force. There's very little hope that you're actually going to stamp out all circulating infectious people during that time. If you lift the restrictions, you essentially have reserved the large pool of susceptible people. You return those people into circulation and the whole thing simply starts up again and reignites. This was the logic behind the paper that came out of Imperial College that caused so much uh, attention uh, about a month ago. And basically they showed that if you have to rely on lockdown life restrictions, you're going to have to alternate. You basically would have to have them in force. You could, re you could lift them, but they will come up again and you put them in force. And this is essentially not how we think of living where you're two thirds off and one third on. It's very hard to think of how the economy, education or any other institutions can work that way. So lockdowns are not in my view, the solution. The second thing I have to report, and it's a little bit of a negative finding, is that in spite of the fact that people seem to think that people are doing a good job at staying at home and a good job of social distancing, available data actually suggests that we're not as good as it is you might think. If you take a look, for example, at uh, uh, projects such as uh, Google Mobility, which is actually tracking people's cell phones to see, are they at home? Are they in parks? Are they in grocery stores? And so on. While you would have expected a great increase in the amount of time people are spending at home, it's not nearly as large as you would think. Um, and uh, similarly, in, in my own modeling, what I've tried to do is ask the following question, tracking actual hospitalizations, that's actually the statistic I'm paying most attention to locally, how many COVID patients are actually in our hospitals. You can work backwards and essentially say, what's the implied level of social distancing that would give you the data that you're seeing? And it turns out that it's not all that impressive. It's about 35%, meaning the transmission is being reduced by about 35% from what it would have been in the absence of control. Now that's a benefit to be sure. It slows down cases going to the hospital. It may in fact keep you from having the number of patients in the hospital break through the hospital's capacity and avert a, a catastrophe in that sense. But it's not a way to actually end the epidemic. It delays the epidemic, it slows it down. So the question is, is there a way out of this rather than simply applying these imperfect measures and, and sort of waiting for the miracle? What could the miracles be? You know, some people think that there will be diminished transmission over the summer because that's what other viruses do. I don't think we can bank on that at all for policy. Uh, so of course, some people think that perhaps there will be a breakthrough therapeutic of the form that Akiko was describing. Again, it's not something we can bank on. My attention has turned to the possibility for ending this thing as opposed to simply having a Band-Aid. And here is the way, in my view, that we actually could end it, at least in those countries which would have the ability to do this. It's a very simple public health principle. In order for infections to be transmitted, you have to have contact between infectious people and susceptible people. We can find out who the infectious people are through very, very aggressive community screening. We did not have the capacity to test properly, and we still don't have it but we are gaining it because many new testing approaches have recently been approved under emergency protocols by the FDA in the United States and also around the world. And so now we are going to see large numbers of diagnostic tests that are rapid, that can give you quick results. And we're also seeing attempts to develop serological tests, although there we still don't really know how that's going to work out for us. But the point is this, everyone says test, 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 but people haven't spent so much time thinking about how you would actually do this. All right, so here's what the actual proposal is. We have to first of all start with the following realization. Testing to date has been driven by symptomatic cases. It's not that tests are used to discover infections, rather people who are sick determine when tests get done. And in the new regime I am imagining, we certainly would continue to use testing in the hospitals both to make sure that the 
patients in most critical needs get the appropriate resources. If you have a competition for a small number of ICU beds, you want the COVID patients to have the negative pressure ICU beds for infection control. You don't want to put that with someone who has COVID-like symptoms, but actually is not nearly so contagious with anything as serious. Um, secondly, you want to continue testing healthcare workers. That's the other place where tests are routinely used because if we lose our healthcare worker health uh, workforce, uh, we're obviously in serious trouble. And the third thing which is done presently is simply to allow people who are symptomatic to get tested if they reach a high enough threshold. In order to get a test, one has to call a doctor, essentially get a referral to one of the drive-by clinics. So that's the sort of environment that we're in right now. The availability of new testing will change all of that. Here's what needs to happen in my view. First of all, on the symptomatic side, anyone with the slightest symptoms that are suggestive of COVID should be able to instantly get a test. That will become possible at high volume drive-through clinics uh, of the form you saw in Korea and of the form that now exists in this country. There have to be many, many more of these things. The reason for this is very simple, which is that research shows that if in fact you could isolate people Roughly at the time, uh, which corresponds to the incubation time, so I'm talking within, say, five days of infection or more or, or, or shorter, uh, that actually alone would bring what's called the reproductive number below unity and could actually put a way out. Now, we're a long way from being able to do that for every infected person, but this is a start. So since we can't rely on people to self-detect, we need to screen and screen aggressively. And what does that mean? Some people have said, you know, we should just be conducting random samples in communities to figure out what the background prevalence is so we get a better handle on, on many things. And I think we do need to have some testing of that form, but I would not use that in any way for the majority of the tests. I would want to invest in background screening so that we can drive what is going to be the real engine here. The real engine is going to be targeted testing where the goal is to find as many <clears throat> infected persons as possible and isolate them. We are not starting blind, uh, speaking as a probability theorist, we're not starting with what you'd call flat priors. We know what's causing these infections. We know that people who are living in the greatest densities are the ones who are most at risk. We see that already in the data collected to date, just on cases in, in mortality. We see that at the local level. So we have to set up a very agile system of testing, mobile testing. Think of tests being conducted in tents outside the entryways of grocery stores or in gas stations or in public housing projects, places like this. Um, it can be done. It's possible to have large volume of testing, millions of tests a day in a country like the United States. Um, the testing would not be, uh, it, it wouldn't be static. If you start seeing that uh, in a testing site, the number of detected infections is going down and your background screening, the random sampling is telling you that there are infections elsewhere, you move, you're agile, you go to where the infections are. So that's the first part of the strategy. But the second part, and this is another thing which I fear has been badly overlooked, testing alone doesn't do anything for you. It's what do you do with the test results? The way that you stop transmission is to isolate people who are infected. Since most people who are going to be discovered who are infected actually will be asymptomatic, they won't really be that sick. The isolation can take place at home. But people don't really have a good understanding of what home isolation entails. There are directives which are out there. The CDC has described things very well, as have other health departments and companies and universities and what have you. But I think people have not really internalized what that means. So people need to know not only that you know, the directives exist, they have to do it. We have to actually find a way that inside a home, a person who's infected is not going to be transmitting infection to the others who live in that household. We also have to recognize that for some infected persons, isolating at home is just not feasible. We have very poor populations in all of our cities. We have situations where there are three families living in a two bedroom apartment with one bathroom. What in the world does it mean to say that an infected person has to isolate in such an environment? It can't be done. So 
part of my plan here also involves the requisition, public requisition of isolation quarters. So this is not for people who have to be hospitalized because they're sick. In fact, they shouldn't even be placed into the subacute field hospitals that we've also set up around the country so that we can have surge capacity to handle the less serious cases, but who are still too ill to be at home. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm literally talking about requisitioning space. It could be hotels, it could be schools, it could be whatever it is that, can be, that, that, that people get their hands on, but basically where people who are infected can be isolated and can be kept out of contact for at least two weeks. And so this is a very, very large effort. But the good side of this is that actually if we implement this, this is not a Band-Aid like lockdowns. This is not a Band-Aid like social distancing. This actually could take a reproductive number as Akiko was talking about, where each infected person could be infecting between two and three others and reduce that number down to something like a half. Because the only time in which an infected person would be infectious would be the time from when they're infected until they've been detected. So you have to really establish the rapid detection and isolation of infected persons. The way to do this most efficiently is not to simply do blanket testing where everyone in the community, everyone in the country is being tested. This has been suggested, by the way, Paul Romer, a Nobel Prize economist has basically said, look, let's just do 30 million tests a day in the United States. He's basically saying, test about 10% of the United States population every day, no targeting, just plain and simple. And uh, you know, if you did that, uh, it, and you were able to isolate who you found, that would work. I'd call that the Jupiter shot. I'm interested more in the moon shot, which is not that you have to do 30 million tests a day. You have to do many fewer millions of tests a day, but you do it in a targeted way. You do it in a smart way. You make it flexible. The last thing I'll say, because I don't want to take so much time, while we are in this lockdown-like period, it's not enough to ask yourself, you know, okay, we're using this time to enable hospitals to restock, replenish, and, pre and prepare. We're uh, also using this time to plan out the actual intervention I'm talking about. And by the way, I can just tell you, at least locally in Connecticut, we're planning this. We are planning to do this, and we're trying to figure out how to do it now. It's all logistics, and it's all operations, uh, but it can be done. But the other people who should be thinking very hard about this, frankly, are people in manufacturing, people in service industries, people in business, because it's important to re-engineer these pieces of the economy, much as Alberto and Arturo were, were talking about before. Look, our entire industry of academia has completely retooled. Look what we're doing right now. We're all online. And so we actually have a relatively easy way out. It's not so easy to go onto Zoom and make cars, all right? You can't do that. You actually have to have people in the plants uh, supervising the robots and supervising the assembly lines. However, there are intermediate positions. You could imagine a situation where workers who have to work in teams are first tested to make sure that they're uninfected, put into essentially an at-work quarantine where just like with the space station, you'll have a group of workers maybe on a two-week shift as opposed to an eight-hour shift. We'll go in, work together, you know, work on whatever it is that's happening in that plant. It could be cars, it could be chemicals, it could be whatever is going on. Their two weeks is up, they come out, the next group rotates in. It's not as efficient. It's certainly going to cost money, but on the other hand, it's a lot better than doing nothing. And we can bring this kind of thinking back into many areas of manufacturing and service sectors. So it's not just about saying, how can we get through this as quickly as possible so we can go back to what we were doing before? I do think that the screening proposal is a way to do this as quickly as possible, but at the same time, the economy needs to open in safe mode. Just like when your computer gets infected with a virus, there is this wonderful thing called safe mode where you can open up your laptop and basically isolate and, and clean out all the places where the virus may have infected you. We kind of have to do the same thing with the economy. We need to reopen, but we need to reopen in safe mode so that we can get back to work. So that, that's my moonshot. We'll see over the coming uh, weeks and months whether or not it's actually possible to pull it off. Thank you for outlining this in such uh, incredible detail and telling us, giving us a sense of what a comprehensive plan looks like. And I, and I fear launching the next poll, but I want to do it after what you just spoke, which is, you know, based on what you just heard, the kind of massive testing and agility 
and smart interventions uh, and, and re-engineering of communities and workplaces that Ed uh, called for. I wonder if you think that uh, your government or the government in the country in which you reside uh, seems to have a plan like this uh, or something comparable uh, to move us forward. Atura, I know you wanted to jump in and there have been several questions for Akiko on immunology that I want to come back to. We only have a few minutes left, but maybe we can all just stay a little bit longer because it's just such such a great discussion. Uh, Arturo, please go ahead. I just I just wanted to complement what Ed just said with the economist economist point of view in a sense because I think uh, reopening the economy in a safe mode is not possible. Uh, I think what you seem to suggest is that we are going to have a, a strict confinement and in the meantime we are going to test more and more people to understand the severity of the pandemic. But first of all, we know at least from what I have been discussing with doctors, that our tests you know, are not reliable, even the ones that we have now in millions. So it would take time to develop tests that tell us exactly whether someone is sick or not. And second, you know, this will take time anyway, and we need to open up, not just because, not just because people need to go out, but because we need to restart our economies, because the cost in human lives, if we don't do that, we talk about people living in small apartments, uh, Surab was talking about people that will starve in India if they don't they don't resume working. So I think that's why we need to to reopen. And my personal point of view is that this is going to be a dilemma in which we need to take risks. I think to me the big question is which type of risks are we willing to take? Because I would I would really love and dream to have a solution that the one that you proposed, uh, where for example you identify someone who is sick and then we put them in confinement in a particular place and the test is completely reliable. I can tell you that in Europe is not possible. First, because we don't have the test. Second, because in most countries it would not be legal to take someone and confine them somewhere outside of their homes. So because of that, that we need to find ways. And actually, I think in countries like Switzerland, even Spain or France, I think we are already making plans for this day confinement in several stages with the understanding that this is going to be a very risky move. Right. But the trade of is that if we don't do that, we are going to lose lives again because people will die in any way. And second, the cost to our economies is going to be such that it will take us years and decades to recover. So, so a cruder way of doing this. I want to get to, to Alberto and Gail who want to jump in, but Akiko, there were a couple of questions earlier that I was going to get back to. Uh, you know, you, you saw that people are more concerned about their health. They're asking questions around, do we know more about whether you're immune uh, post-infection? Do we have a sense of how long immunity might last? Um, Ed mentioned not just uh, testing for the presence of the virus, but also antibody testing. Are there things happening in that space? Is the science advancing fast enough that we'll get better insights, better data that become actionable for both business and government? Yeah, so these are all really important questions to how, you know, that will help reopen the society. Um, and I, I agree with Ed that uh, PCR testing and knowing who's infected is, is really incredibly important. But the other kinds of tests that Ed also mentioned is the serology test, which measures antibodies against the virus. So that tells you that a person has been exposed um, to the virus and have developed an antibody against the virus. It is not absolutely uh, guaranteed that if somebody has an antibody, uh, that that person is uh, no longer um, infectious or that person is protected from uh, reinfection with the same virus. So there is a caveat that the antibody testing tells you that a person is exposed to the virus, but it it may not tell you that the person is um, safe to go back. And that's why we need a combination testing uh, for PCR, for infectious virus, as well as antibody to tell you that the person has recovered uh, from the virus infection. And uh, reinfection has been reported. Um, multiple cases have been reported so far. Now, um, it's unclear what, whether those are actual reinfection or uh, somebody who's harboring the virus somewhere in deep in the lung um, ha has reactivated the virus and became sick again. So the immunity around this virus is still um, not clear enough for us to say, here's a measure that we can take and this is the measurement that we need. Um, Alberto, jump in on uh, the argument as well. So progress on testing, but 
uncertainty around the reliability of the inferences for some time. And, and that's one of the reasons why Duro says we're going to have to take some risk as we figure out how to strike a balance, at the very least until we don't have this infrastructure stood up that Ed calls for. What, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, we're going to have to take some risks, as Arturo says, because otherwise we starve to death and then we're dead anyway. Um, but I think that we have to move along what Ed, what Ed was saying. Not only we have to do more intelligent testing and more intelligent handling of the cases, but we also have to do more intelligent handling of the economy. There are things that cannot shut down simply because they're essential for survival, food, medicine, security, etc. There are things that, like the glorious stadium behind me in the picture, that uh, cannot be done safely. This thing, this thing will have to be shut down until we have a vaccine, uh, maybe many, many moons from now. But, but there's a lot of things in the middle. There's a lot of things where the question we should be asking is, well, can I re under what infrastructure can this factory reopen? Under which practice can this factory reopen? If we, if we reopen the factory the, the old way, the contagion rate within the factory is this much. Well, if we, cha in, if we change which practices or which facilities, can we take it down to this or down to this or further down? And then we once begin, we begin quantifying those questions, those answers, then we can, as Arturo says, take chances, but they will be far more intelligent chances, just in the same way that we can actually not go the, down the Romer path, which is not feasible in the poorest countries in the world anyway, but rather instead of doing uh, testing 10% of the population, test intelligently 1% of the population and use the data results from that also intelligently. And then we can begin to dismantle this little by little, piece by piece, taking a little bit more risk, but a, but a much more qualified, understood, and controlled risk. All right. So so the role of business here, uh, or the task for business, isn't just you know dealing with the opening and closing as you know Yoshi uh, sort of helped us understand and others, but it but it really is about re-engineering workplaces, flows yeah. of people. It goes much uh, much further down. Gail, you had a reaction also earlier to to the exchange. Yeah, I had actually a question for Edward and possibly Akiko, and I, I don't want to take uh, time away from the participants' questions, but Ed, the, the type of uh, testing system that you envision, could you give us an idea of its cost um, and its feasibility? Um, you know, because we're talking about measures that, that are, um, we're talking about costs and benefits of different measures, and we know the lockdown has cost us maybe 30% of GDP even the short period it's lasted uh, in some countries. What, what would be the cost of, of ongoing testing and is it feasible? Do we have tests? So I, I can't answer you totally because I, that I haven't costed everything out here. But what one very crude way of thinking about the cost is simply to take a look, take a look at how long would it take to essentially reduce the number of new infections down to what is I won't say negligible, but manageable level. This is something which actually could gain control of the outbreak in a manner of say six weeks if it was done right. So if you contrast that against what the cost is of keeping us shut down over six weeks, I think that it doesn't really matter in some way because it's not gonna approach that economic loss. So there's that. Uh, as I said, these tests are becoming uh, more available now. And, and I mean, the encouraging news is that they're, they're being produced by big ticket manufacturers, uh, you know, comp companies like Abbott, uh, Merck, all, all, all these large companies which are, which are producing these tests. So some of them have already started to arrive. Uh, the, in, in, at the Elm Haven Hospital now, we already have this uh, Abbott rapid test, which uh, can actually uh, start to finish, can tell you in 15 minutes if, uh, if a person has been infected. It, it, it turns out that it actually takes longer to tell you if a person is not infected. Uh, this is a quirk of the so-called PCR, polymerase chain reaction testing method which is actually amplifying DNA until you can actually see it. So what happens is uh, if, if your first amplification doesn't reveal the, co the coronavirus uh, DNA or RNA, I should say, you, you, you go to the, another amplification, another amplification. And if you do it, however many cycles is the maximum and you still don't see anything, only then do you conclude that the person's not infected. So it actually takes more time to get to the end of the road 
So the idea that you would do this in real time where you would actually say, okay, a person comes in and has got tested, I'm going to have you sit and wait until you got the test result. I don't think that's the way to do it. I think what you do is you gain samples rapidly, rapidly. It doesn't take long to take a sample, all right? Uh, and then the idea would be overnight. You, you basically run these things, and so you would get your results back quickly. Um, I, 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 Kiko might know. I, I, I actually don't know the per test cost of doing this. But again, my sense is just rather than thinking in terms of, ab of absolute numbers, if you think relatively, how long would it take for, how long would you have to continue this type of an effort and contrast against how long would you have to continue doing these alternating on again, off again shutdowns? It just seems that the trade-off is overwhelmingly in favor. And plus there's another thing, this not only just finds people, fewer people get infected because as I said, you're really changing the transmission of the disease by making this separation. That means fewer people are going to be sick, fewer people are going to die. So for any reasonable economic valuation for the value of a life, I think it's again, uh, a clear win uh, in, in investing in this type of a program. Uh, if it was going to be something that you had to do continually you know, up until you had a vaccine, that would be a different question. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you can actually change the course of the epidemic. This essentially could work in the same way from transmission dynamic point of view as what would, what would happen uh, if you had a vaccine. It wouldn't work in the same way. Vaccines basically give you herd immunity. That's not what this would be doing. This would basically be separating, preventing transmission. So you have infected people, but it doesn't matter so much because they have nobody around them who they can infect. Uh, and, and the idea is to put an infrastructure together so that in a short period of time, you can basically get most infected people out of that kind of contact. And then in the future after that, you just have to have the infrastructure set up so that you can find people quickly uh, when local pockets of infection uh, pop up. I just, I just want to say one other thing, and I want to reemphasize this. To me, a huge risk in the United States and in other Western countries is the fact that you have uh, importation. That's one thing. And then the other thing I want to say, I just want to make a little compare and contrast because it's interesting. If you think of Israel, Israel has about a population of just over 8 million people. The number of cases in Israel is uh, less than the number of cases in Connecticut, which has a population of 3.6 million. The number of deaths in Israel is lower than the number of, of deaths in Connecticut. And yet in Israel, they have enlisted the security service to have a cell phone tracking application so that they, they've located hundreds of people who are asymptomatically infected and had no idea. And though those people have been put into home isolation as a result. And the country there feels that the government is failing and, and that the epidemic is not being contained. As opposed to what's happening here, Oh, and all flights in and out of the country have been canceled, by the way, so it's not, it's not possible to go anymore. And entire sections of certain cities have been locked off from other parts of the country, uh, parts of Jerusalem, uh, B'nai Brak, certain areas. The point I'm trying to make here is that here you have a situation which is undergoing a much more severe lockdown-like uh, 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 intervention. And actually their, their outbreak is, is much smaller given the population size compared to where, we, where I'm sitting right now, where we don't have anywhere near as severe restrictions, things, things are worse off. And, and in the former situation, people are screaming that, you know, this is terrible, this is a failure. And here it's kind of like, okay, this is a crisis, but, but um, people aren't panicking in the same way. So it's just very interesting, I think, to take a look at, at people's different sensitivities in different locations, uh, as uh, uh, I think it was either Alberto or Arturo, uh, you know, people do obviously take risks and we have to take risks. Uh, we lose many, you know, tens of thousands of lives in the United States, we lose the influenza every year. We don't panic about influenza, it's an acceptable risk. It's an acceptable risk because it's vaccine controllable and it's under your individual decision as to whether or not you get vaccinated or not. Look, we have tens of thousands of people dying in car accidents. We don't panic about that because the economic benefit of being able to drive wherever we wanna go in a car is greater than the cost of saying, oh, well, because we don't want anyone to die in, die in a car accident, so we'll just ban driving. So, you know, we, we make these kinds of trade-offs all the time. It's just very difficult to do in this situation because there hasn't been uh, a, a, a feeling 
that the thing actually can be controlled because the tools aren't there. So I think we can gain control of it, and and that will change the calculus. And and you know, if if we're successful in the, in that way, it's it's going to make so many other things uh, just easier to deal with. Just just to uh, add to this, as I'm trying to uh, wrap this up, and I I have a sense that you know we could continue this conversation for a long time because there's so much that we haven't gotten to. But of course. Um, the ability to do something like what you've described, Ed, is going to require, of course, a lot of sort of logistical operations, managerial capacity, collaboration between the private and pro public sector, but also uh, a legal infrastructure, as Arturo and, and Yoshi reminded us, in some countries, governments are constrained in terms of what they can require. Uh, but also, you know, we're going back to what Gail said before, the trust in institutions, that if the government tells you, do this, do that, we're going to put you here, that that's going to work. So all of that points to a lot of heterogeneity and responses. And it sounds like this only works if you can then keep people apart. And so I wonder if sort of one corollary, corollary of what you said is that effectively every country and perhaps even every region or every city is going to fend uh, for itself. And I know we have a poll about this because I do want to close uh, going back to, to Sarav, uh, who uh, you know has reminded us you know, really what, what the implications are in densely populated poor countries that might not be anywhere near to being able to deploy this sort of coordinated uh, capacity. Ben, if we could have the poll, please, about you know whether we think uh, poor countries in particular will have to fend for themselves or whether they'll get substantial help. In other words, you know, are we all going to turn inwards as we try to figure this out, or um, will we find sort of new ways of collaborating and, and new solidarity? Sarav, um, how are you thinking about this as you're listening to this proposal, the feasibility in a place like India, more generally, what, what do the poorer parts of the world uh, need from, from rich countries right now? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there is a tremendous amount to gain from the so-called developed nations, the rich countries on, on the medical front, on the epidemiology front and the public health front, because so many of you are ahead of the curve and we can certainly learn from the various models and decide what is suitable for us. And if I have to take a guess, most probably the, the real medicine will come from the West, uh, given the amount of resources uh, they can deploy to, to find the solution. But when it comes to this humanitarian thing, the livelihood issues that I was talking about, I think we are in a very unique situation. And here, it will not help to look at even China. It will, it's a very diff different political system. It will certainly not help to look at US or Western Europe, and we will have to evolve our, our new models. Uh, David, we have always failed our poor. I mean, that's not, that's not new. And we are failing them even more now. So uh, we have to do the basics. We have to ensure that they have food, uh, they have uh, you know, something, some place to a safe place to stay. And even among them, we have to make sure that who are the ones who are the vulnerable population who might be infected and they have to be dealt in a very different manner. Whereas the others, uh, please note, it's already 21 days past the, past the lockdown. And if we had focused on those people, then many of them probably could have by this time sent back home. We just can't afford to stop our buses, stop our trains and, and prevent people. It's unbelievable. People have traveled, walked 500 kilometers to go back to their villages because there was no, no conveyance. And there are people who have died on the wheel. I mean, the, the, these, are, these are sad. You know, There was this migrant labor who was given food and he started crying. And, and people asked him, why are you crying? He said, you know, I can't imagine that since yesterday, I was, I was kind of a proud construction worker and today I'm destitute. And, and imagine the psychological effect that is having on people who have been told overnight that you have nothing to depend on. Your family who is living 500 kilometers away have nothing to eat and you have to fend for yourself. So I think on, on both these two counts, we have to have a balance. Thank you. Um, Yoshi, you have the last word. Um, two very quick things on this testing um, that uh, the potential risk and then also cost that we have to bear in mind is we are, there is always any kind of test that has possibility of uh, false positive and a false negative. And when you're not ready, if you start doing that, all of testing, even just very small percentage of those false positive, false negative, false positive is gonna start eating up your medical resources and false uh, negative is gonna like you let the people out and start creating Clusters. That was actually one of the main reasons why that the government back home has been cautious about doing that at the very early stage, where that nobody really knows what's going on. 
And so unless you are ready in terms of like, you know, David, as you have mentioned earlier, legally, like logistically, or like managerially, that you have the infrastructure of doing it, you may create the, another different problem. Um, one last thing that I want to say is the uh, tied to what the, uh, you are asking to Sora to share his insights with us, that the situation is also uh, like in a similar, I mean, the uh, very um, uh, similar situation that we have been seeing in even in developed economies like for the last couple of weeks, as Ed mentioned, the most essential work that the people are actually doing are the ones who actually been paid the lowest right, in, 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 the, in the whole economy. And there is the uh, Michael Sandals piece and a couple of days ago in the New York Times, are uh, we all in this together? And then also like, you know, the uh, Andreas Kluz piece in Bloomberg, it says, anybody need a management consulting right now? Thought not. And so all of this system that we have created for the last 60, 70 years and a global network and then a business school is actually up to hardcore uh, part of it, meritocracy based like an economic system is now being questioned that those people who are actually working at the, you know, the paying at the risk uh, of their life uh, is the one that's actually helping us to survive and are getting paid the lowest. Whereas that we are joining like in you know, this discussion from Zoom in a very safe environment and talking about all of these, you know, great things, but the, how much of the uh, impact that are we making is really like, you know, the, uh, we have to wait and see. And so when we go back to reopen, like, you know, reopening, what does that really mean? Are we really going back to the, our, like, you know, the normal that we used to have? Is that a new normal or is that like a completely new society that we need to rebuild again? And so, so it's not just uh, like an emerging economy and maturity economy, it's actually a pretty global phenomena that yeah, we really now have to think about what we have been doing pre like, you know, COVID-19. I think your, your comments and, and Saurav's before are just a powerful reminder that uh, all of us who who joined this panel and and those who watched it, uh, you know, are privileged, uh, you know, supposedly in secure places, able to work remotely, uh, able to engage in those discussions. Uh, but these discussions do have to happen, and and I'm so glad that we had it, that we brought these different disciplinary and regional perspectives to bear. I'm I'm encouraged that by a sliver uh, option two here, that uh, four countries will get help, uh, gains a plurality of votes. Um, certainly, um, uh, our audience uh, does not believe that all is lost. In fact, uh, that there is uh, not just urgent need, but the real opportunity for cooperation and collaboration that countries share best practices. We know it's happening uh, among scientists, among immunologists, virologists. Um, it happens on, on the business side and, and pharmaceuticals and so on. It's happening among central banks, uh, and hopefully uh, it's going to begin to happen as well among cities, governors, mayors who are uh, working to build these kind of agile systems at, uh, that you called for as the surest way of, of getting through this with minimal uh, loss of life and, and minimal harm to livelihoods. But it's certainly not going to be flipping a light switch and everything is back to how it was uh, you know, in, in December of 2019. I think we'll keep the conversation going. That's what the Global Network is all about. I'm so grateful to our panelists, uh, grateful to everybody who connected. A recording is going to be available. Uh, and uh, you can find all of us, uh, you know, every faculty member is listed somewhere on the uh, website of their school if you'd like to follow up with questions or comments. Thank you so much to all of you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.